Welcome to Next Level Carpentry. Uh, I'm Matt Jackson and got a bunch of work to do in the shop today. I spent kind of a ridiculous amount of time over the weekend on a certain April 1st uh, video release and now I've got to get with it and finish the aging on these box beams. Uh, two previous videos, you can uh, link to them over here, uh, shows how to build the beams and how to do this faux joinery in them. But today's job is to age these beams 100 years in an hour. Uh, this beam, this is the box beam finished up. It's all smooth, but the job calls for uh, an aged look. I want these beams to look like 100 year old beams out of an old barn put up in a family room. So I've taken the steps to texture the beams, which is what I'll show today. There's a number of steps uh, that I listed out here and uh, we'll, go th we'll go through those, I don't know, 10 steps or so to get them aged. But then the process for getting to this finish, see if you can see this. Um, this is the weathered look that I'm after in the end uh, with some faux finishing techniques on here. And that'll be a separate video because of the number of steps involved to achieve that. Um, but as it is, I'm just going to get this set up. I'm not going to do a lot of work editing this video because you can see the steps involved and the tools I use to do this so that you can age wood 100 years in an hour. It's going to be a little tricky to film this because of uh, the fact that I've got to set up over here to work to be at a comfortable height with a sturdy back prop. Um, I've got to do these pieces. This, uh, these three sections are um, the last three of 12 total sections that need to texture process. I saved those to last so I could shoot this video. I'm going to set up my master carpenter saw horses down here because they're sturdy and portable. It's going to be a tricky camera angle, but if you want to know how to age beams 100 years in an hour, you'll figure it out. So I've got this in place and I could pretty much run through all the gears, uh, all the steps for aging this on this center section of beam. It's got uh, two of the false wedged tenons in it, so you'll be able to see how to, those get installed and aged. If you're one of those who watched the two previous videos about how to build these box beams, you'll understand that razor sharp uh, mitered corner. The miter is fit tightly and glued all the way through. And then the tenon, uh, mortise and tenon joinery fits accurately with another, with the other section that goes here. And then there's a crisp recess in the side where the tenon wedges go. It's a little bit of a shame to take this flawless beam and age it, but that's what the job's about. So that's what I'm going to do. Because 100% of this surface has to have the aged and weathered look, I don't want to leave any small flat spots with this milled finish. And I found the simplest way to uh, ensure 100% coverage of the textured finish is to just use a pencil, uh, nice next level carpentry pencil here with a flat tip and I just scribble on the surface with lines that go out to the edge and are pretty close together through the middle. When all the pencil marks are removed I know I've got 100% coverage with the texture. And I do this on each surface as I go but for the video's sake I'm just going to do it on this top for now. I like to put my hand on one edge, makes the process quick. I've got 200 square feet of this uh, to do total and this method is pretty fast. So there you have it, step one, squiggle marks. Uh, step two for this aging process is to give a hand scraped texture to 100% of the surface. And I do that with two tools, they're both very cool an old bench plane and an even older spoke shave. Uh, this one is somewhere from my family lineage. I wish I knew where and who, but I, um, I kind of channel whoever made and used this tool. It appears to be pretty much handmade. Uh, maybe somebody can tell me. I'm guessing it's probably 150 years old, but I don't know if it's from my mom's side of the family or my dad's, and uh, the way events are, I'm never going to know. Um, but anyways, uh, this has just the slightest curve to it. I tried to find a new one with a little more of a curve so that I could plane out in the middle of flat, flat surfaces. Uh, I couldn't find another one. Um, 
but I like the fact that it's got a slight curve to it rather than just straight. And the blade is curved this way. There's a lot of them out there that have a straight knife and the sole is curved this way for shaving cabriole legs and such. Uh, this would work for that, but it's just a little bit different. Anyways, it's the tool I have. It works great for this process. The other tool is this old bedrock uh, number 605 bench plane. And there's a story behind this plane too. Uh, I was doing some work for some great people um, and the gentleman uh, had a trunk of tools from his opa, his grandpa. Um, it didn't fit anywhere in his uh, um, family tree, uh, as, I'd, uh, as I might say. So he gave me this old chest of tools, or this chest of old tools, and one of them was this treasure out of that chest. Um, like many tools from old chests, it was in a great state of disrepair. I used uh, Sandflex blocks uh, to clean up the uh, surfaces. I repainted it, polished up the front handle. I actually made a new walnut burl handle for the back. That's um, from a walnut tree that grew downtown Rapid City for who knows how long, uh, but it made for a perfectly fitting new handle. It's uh, just a treasure to hold. Anyways, the special thing about this plane is how, um, how I treated the iron. I'm going to hope this shows up in the video. Uh, the plane is supposed to have a straight iron. The straighter the better for planing work. But what I did was took the iron out and, and I ground the edge to a, to a radius. It's very slight. That's probably raises up an eighth inch across this two, I don't know, two, two and a quarter inch width. Um, I'm not going to go through the sharp, sharpening process here, but uh, I've gone through all the gears on that. Um, grinding it hollow and putting a micro bevel that's planed or um, honed out to, I don't know, 1200 grit, I think. Uh, but that shine means I've got to do a lot less work in pushing the plane. But the chip breaker doesn't fit to that curve, but that doesn't seem to be problematic. This is a bevel down setup for this old bench plane. Careful not to nick that edge because I'm the one that's got to fix it if I do. The other modification I had to do was to widen the throat of this a little bit. And I know I corrupted the plane forevermore uh, for doing flat work, but uh, it's living a new life as a hand scraping tool and um, rather than just sitting uh, getting all rusty in an old trunk. But I made those two modifications to the plane for this work. I've used it on other projects. Uh, there's a massive oak mantle. You can see in a video there it's just raw video but this plane I originally made it to texture that mantle and it worked great for this. And I've got a decent protrusion on here. sure if you can see that, but as long as the two uh, corners where the curve meets the edges of the iron, as long as those aren't sticking down, I'll get a smooth scraping uh, cut without those straight lines from the edge. I like to wear these sticky blue Atlas Smurf gloves because it helps me grip the tools better. It's enough work pulling these things as it is without expending energy in the grip. I'm using my Master Carpenter saw horses. One of these days I'm going to do a build video to show how to build those puppies because I just love those things. One of the features of the sawhorses is how far this end projects past the leg. That gives me clamping room here which is important but because of the angle of the leg the horses aren't tippy in this point because there's no cantilever in the horse. Here again I'm using taking advantage of the spreader bar inside the beam to clamp this horse down, this eighth inch shoulder on here um, holds like crazy. I can put all the clamping pressure I want on that, holds it rigid to the sawhorse so that I can work and not worry about it sliding around. Anybody that watched the beam build video knows that there's just one pocket hole screw that holds this piece in. The other side is just resting in that dado and it's not going anywhere. All right, well, it's my belief that. Uh, aged beams don't have sharp, crisp corners like that. Uh, they've gotten beat up. Uh, they're never that sharp in the first place. 
So um, the first thing I'm doing is using a spoke shave to peel these corners down. And the farther I can go in, I'll get an, uh, a waviness in that beam that keeps it from looking uh, manufactured like it is. Keep in mind that the biggest mistake in um, aging a beam like this is to have anything repetitive in it. So the degree and the angle and the amount of curve I have on these corners, I try to make it as randomly random as I possibly can. And I'm mainly working on this top piece. I'll rotate the beam and do more uh, spoke shave work on the side um, when it comes time to do that face. Grain direction becomes really important on a wood like this oak. Uh, the grain undulates in and out. You can see it in here. And there's a right way and a wrong way to plane. And, and the shavings are coming up smooth and easy in this direction right here. But as soon as I pass this knot, the grain's coming up like this and it just tears out. So I have to, if I want to eliminate that roughness, which in general I do on this one, uh, sometimes the rougher the better, I just have to reverse the direction of the spoke shave. And I'll take advantage of this grain structure to leave like a knot profile in the end of this, or the edge of this beam. I could do the whole video just about spoke shaving corners, but I think you get the idea. I'll zoom right in here, and you can see the this distinct line here. That's where the miter fits together between the uh, this piece and the side piece, but that miter has absolutely no space in it. It's tight and just a microscopic glue line in there. So when I go to spoke shave the sides of this, If I leave that transition somewhere in the curve, it virtually disappears. That's about as good a shot as I'm going to get. The miter line is right there at the tip of my little blue finger. And for all intents and purposes, it's gone. I'll show you one more little spot here. There's a real difficult spot in the grain where this knot feature uh, is in the wood. Uh, for this beam, that's just perfect to have. Gives a wonderful look and effect for the solid beam look. But the grain direction changes all kinds of ways over here. So I'll pay a little more attention to the spoke shaving process. And there's no predictor of which way the grain is going to go, depending if the knot was on the surface or down below. This grain can go either direction. Just start shaving and you'll figure it out. But I should be able to plane away from the knot both directions and get a smooth cut. If I reverse and go this way, it tends to tear out more. And a little bit of that roughness is good, but I don't want so much. So I've kind of dipped this down on both sides of this knot. I'll do the same thing on the side so that that kind of swells up like it would if there was a branch grown out of that old tree, which at one point there was. The spoke shaving process is a little bit uh, more uh, art and science uh, to get a good effect. But I'll just finish tuning up this corner before moving on to the next step. Uh, 
I think that'll be passable. I'll go ahead and flip the beam um, and do the other edge before moving on. I suppose that time lapse was 15 minutes or so. Getting the other corner of the beam. And also did the end where the beams meet and then the edge where it's going to um, butt up to the ceiling. I don't want a clean, crisp, no gap scribe fit to the ceiling. There's going to be some irregularity there and I'm just going to roll with it. But when that's done, you can kind of see the pencil marks are now all that's left in the middle. All these edge surfaces are uh, hand scraped away on the sides and on the face. Same thing on the face. You can see where the pencil marks disappear out here in places where, where I go a little farther in with the scraper to kind of give it a general hand hewn scraped look. I'm going to show a close up of this tenon section. Um, if you watch the video of how these joints were made, this is a very close fit. It would be acceptable for a stained, uh, sanded and varnished finish. Uh, I still want the joint to be tight so you can't see into the hollow beam, but I want the edge where these surfaces to meet uh, to have a, a rough look. It's a little difficult to get a spoke shave in here. I can do some of it. But I want the crisp corners to go away uh, in the finished product. So I'm doing a little extra hand work here. I'm just using a regular sharp chisel and kind of working that edge. I don't, I don't want these to look, this uh, sharp corner here to look quite as precise as it is. I'm kind of hogging that out a little bit with the chisel to get that sharpness to go away. Grain's going the wrong direction there. In a finished beam, that would be an absolute travesty, but here it just adds effect. A little bit perversely, I guess. Knock that sharp corner off there. A chisel's a little better suited to this end grain than a spoke shave. But I do that on both ends. I do it to the tongue of uh, the uh, tenon as well to get the ultimate fit I'm after. And I don't want to take the sharp corner off all the way through because then theoretically you could see down into the beam. The hand chisel allows me to put a little bit of extra detailed effect into the hand hewn look of things here. Uh, doing a straight beam like a mantelpiece, you don't have the same kind of uh, interior edges and corners, so that step wouldn't always be necessary. So I'm happy with how that covers the first two steps. Again, uh, every product, every project is going to be a little bit different. The edges, the requirements, the wood species, what the customer wants, all those things are different, but uh, the methods I've shown so far are adaptable to pretty much anything. Um, so you have to use a little bit of creativity and uh, knowledge and insight into your project, your customer, and the end result to determine how far you take any of these steps or even if you use them in the first place. But you can see I uh, worked up a pretty good uh, sweat here peeling those edges. The uh, next step is using this plane with uh, custom ground iron to give a hand scrape finish um, to remove all the rest of the pencil marks on here so the surface is 100% uh, hand tooled. I'll put the camera down close to the wood and you can see the surface that's milled in that DW735 thickness planer and then the reflection shows those edges with the hand scrape texture and it gives a little bit of a burnish as the iron goes over the steel so it has that hand worked shine to it where this other part Still got the mill marks in it with kind of a little more of a satin finish.
This next step starts much like the last one by uh, clamping the beam down. I'll be pushing that direction so all this does is keep the beam from sliding off the horse and landing on my toe. This will be tricky to get in the camera too, uh, but basically I'm just going to plane any pencil marks I see, just plane till they're gone. And I kind of use an in and out uh, stroke where the plane dips down and takes a scoop and comes back up. I'm being careful to pull the plane backwards or to, to lift the nose of the plane when I pull it backwards because I'm the one that has to sharpen that iron and I don't want to dull it prematurely. It's tough enough on this white oak. Try to work with the uh, uh, grain texture itself. That's as random as you can get. Um, change my plane stroke accordingly so that it doesn't look like a uniform machined look. Uh, the grain around this knot, as expected, is wavy and difficult. And take smaller strokes and kind of poke around there to get something I like. I'll point out that the bottom of this beam is two pieces of wood. You can see it here just ever so slightly, but this is the time when that matters most, getting good grain flow and grain direction. I talk about that in the video for building the beam. So that seam pretty much goes away, even though it's right there in front of God and everybody on the show face of this beam. But even in here where the grain gets complicated, it flows pretty well and makes the solid beam look more convincing. One difficulty that can happen is, even though the grain matches, on one side of the joint the grain might be going up in this direction and the other might be going down in that direction, so planing across that grain will tear out one side and leave the other smooth. But I've got one more step uh, in this hand texturing process to minimize the effect that has and it actually makes the end result better in my opinion. I'm going to go back into time-lapse mode here while I finish planing out these three faces of this beam with this old Bailey plane with its custom sharpened iron. And I'm just hoping Opa is smiling down when he sees this tool getting warmed up from work all these years after his hands last held it. Got a pretty respectable pile of uh, shavings going there. Got a few more to make before uh, ready for the next phase of the weathering process or the aging process. Uh, I thought I'd uh, just spray this down with a little bit of alcohol and drop the camera in close so you can see uh, how this effect is coming along using these tools in this sequence. Some projects can stop right here with the hand scraped look. This is, has a pretty convincing hand hewn look to it. You could take it up a notch or down a notch depending on what the requirement is. But the various contours and textures can't be repeated with a machine of any kind I've ever seen. There's some log home builders use with a curved sole power plane with a curved knife that gives nice even scallops on a large scale. But for something like this, that's just going to look too contrived in my opinion, especially for a project like this. I talked about uh, the tear out that shows up when the grain waves in different directions in tight quarters and you can't quite get it all planed out evenly. There's a fair amount of that on this face of the beam. I'll do a close up and show one way that I address that. You can see around this grain feature here, there's a lot of grain tear out. Uh, the grain, let's see it, come, there was a bump here in the wood and the grain flowed over that bump. Let's see if I got that angle right. Yeah, so this, coming from this direction, will get under those flakes. Going this way will smooth them out. Same thing on the other side. And I can tell by the way the tear out is oriented around this spot what the tree actually looked like. If, if, the, if there was a dip in the wood, if this was the inside of the tree over here and not the outside, this would be reversed. But the way I deal with that tear out, because I don't want quite so much of that in this project, is I've got this file. 440, uh, I think it's called a fishtail chisel. Uh, it's four uh, centimeters deep. 
and the chisel is 40 centimeters wide. If I've got my metric right, I think that's what that means. But I've got this thing sharpened to a mirror finish. These come uh, extremely sharp when they're purchased. I've tuned it up just a little bit from use, but I found it's deep enough to get after these little defects, but shallow enough it doesn't look like uh, so much of a scoop. And all I've done is, is just pound the surface with the chisel and scoop out little pieces. I don't really want to use a mallet. I will in some cases, but this seems to be fine just doing it handheld and freehand to chip out those tear out spots by going the opposite direction that the plain iron went. If I think that the area is too small, I can just enlarge it um, to, for the effect, even though it's not necessary for the particular grain that I'm cleaning up. Where these two, there's two boards on the side here, they're joined uh, with a glue line right here. If the grain was running opposite directions on the other side of that joint, I might have to go in at an angle like this, go 90 degrees to the tear out so that I didn't just move tear out from one side of the glue joint to the other. Once I get over to this side of the knot, I have to go the other direction with the chisel. Knocking the camera in the process. I got out the flashlight here to help show up some of that stuff in the grain. I haven't always had the privilege of the nice window in the shop. I have to have it closed while shooting video because of the light. But when that window's open, the sunlight rakes across here and I can see all this grain as clear as can be. So if you have trouble seeing uh, the details in the grain and don't have a window, a flashlight works great. Just rake it across the surface so you can see what's going on. All these chips were made from the plain iron going this way, so I'll go the opposite way with the chisel. Grain's really, grain's really flat right here. It changes direction. And it's not really visible, but now I'm getting this extra cool chiseled effect near the corner of the beam for getting those little um, splinters out of there. There's some more right here. <clears throat> And I find that the character of the wood um, sets a random pattern pretty nicely. If I just go and get these rough spots out of the wood, I don't have to contrive and just somewhere out in the middle pick a place. I'm not just picking places out in the middle to add this texture because if I go along and clean up the grain, it adds them. If I want a little more texture or um, anything like that, I can go and just contrive places and add a little detail to the beam. This looks to be a place where the grain switches on either side of that line. See the, the joint line in the wood is right here, right in that grain. It's carefully uh, disguised, which is the whole intent, but the grain switches. So I've got to go one direction on one side of it and the other on the other. If that gets really tough, I can always go across the grain to get it out. So I hope that you get the idea of another way of detailing this hand textured look. This could use, uh, you could use this chisel around knots if you're using a, a cruder grade of wood. You could carve around knots to accentuate them. Um, you can just give a random texture in, in stubborn places or uh, just to add interest to the look. Well, I hope you can see there what a, a sharp fishtail gouge chisel will do uh, for texturing. And by mixing and matching these various techniques, you can do all sorts of contouring. Again, that uh, massive oak mantle, I use these techniques and a few more uh, to get a different look. But um, these are a great uh, set of tricks to use for getting a hand-scraped, hand-tooled, uh, hand-planed 
look uh, on a surface of a piece of wood. Uh, the smoother the wood, the smoother the texture, the more knotty the wood, the more um, detail and contour you can put in it for a convincing look like it was literally a tree that had branches sticking out and it was squared off to make the beam and make it as true as possible uh, starting off with a tree. So uh, I'm going to leave it at that. The next step is going to be the actual aging process to uh, add a weathered look like these beams set out uh, in a barn or um, in an old warehouse or an old mine for a century. And we'll get that in one quick step. I'm going to take the alcohol, spray this down so you can see uh, this texture before I take into the aging process. I think if I go from this end, you can see the light a little better. The beam tapers off, has a little roundness going up to the ceiling. Here's the tear out spots, a little fishtail gouge, getting some of that. But pretty consistently random. And this audio is going to be horrible because it's double mic'd. This is some of the most fun work that I do. There's a lot of work that goes into these jobs leading up to this process. There's a lot of work to be done to finish it up. So it's really nice to do this manual, hands-on, working with hand tools, working with real wood kind of work once in a while. I tell my customers that this is the reason I do these jobs. I do sheetrock repair, uh, remodeling, planning, dealing with subcontractors and designers, everything else. But when I get to this part of the work, that's why I take the job. This is fun stuff. I wanted to take one more handheld shot of the surface of this with a, a hand scraping effect on it before I hit this with the aging process. And I think you might agree that that's a pretty decent uh, hand hewn look in its own right. But now I'm going to age it. And the way I do that is with a knotted wire wheel and a grinder. I really like this Metabo WE10125 5-inch grinder. It's got a great positive lock on the guard. The guard is sturdy and doesn't flop around like some other models I've had. And I can easily rotate it around and put it in race car mode for doing this texture work. And I'm using um, this knotted wire wheel. It's just straight orientation. It's not a cup brush. A cup brush is going to turn in this direction and churn the grain out this way. This gets down and just wipes the grain out, pulls the soft grain out from in between the hard grain for a much better effect because there's no machine marks of these short uh, twirling action that you get from a cup brush. I think this is going to be pretty tricky to show. I switched the camera angle, got the light coming in here. Uh, basically, what I'm doing is I'm just running this brush with the grain, trying not to turn it, trying not to tilt the grinder sideways either way to get that swirling motion. I just want a straight linear scrubbing action of that grain. This is a variable speed model, which I really like. I've got the speed cranked down a ways to get in here for this grain. During the work, I'm using earplugs. Got a full face shield here that I clean with a dryer sheet to keep the static from pulling all the dust onto it. I did a video about that recently. Check it out if you haven't seen it. Put some light on it. You can easily see the difference from this side of the beam where I haven't hit with the wire brush to the other side. Green just all weathered out. It just takes a light pass with that wire wheel. Other options for this are to uh, use sandblasting. Some people use a torch to kind of burn the grain out. I don't want all that blackness going on and I don't want sand embedded in the wood. I don't want to take it somewhere to have it soda blasted or hit with walnut shells or whatever. So that wire wheel, I can control it completely for the exact amount of effect that I want, no more, no less. If I wanted this a more subtle texture, I could get a, a finer uh, wire diameter that's not so stiff. It would uh, be a smoother effect. I can push harder to wear it out more. I can um, do it more in some areas than others. It's all very controllable. I can do it right here in the shop. I wanted to present this uh, process starting here with a small grinder. Uh, what I learned was that this is a lot of work. There's a lot of surface area on this beam. 
and this tool would just overheat and burn up if I went all went at it uh, all day long with this. So I took it to the next level and got a six inch knotted wire wheel and I'm using this old Milwaukee buffer that I have, a seven inch polisher and uh, let's see if it has an RPM on here, 1750 RPM. That's as fast as I'd want to go. I've had this tool for <laughs> probably 50 years literally and um, it works fine for this. The big disadvantage is it does not have a guard. I'm not recommending that for anybody. Um, not sure what your comfort zone is with things. I put an extender on here that I use for uh, buffing uh, cars, automotive work. I've buffed cars hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. All sorts of work with this tool. I'm comfortable with the way it works. Um, and I have just used this wire brush on here but there's no guard. I'm using it in this fashion. If I hit my wrist on there, it's going to send me to ER. I could fashion some sort of a guard in here, but I've chosen not to. I'm comfortable with the work height, uh, the sturdiness of the wood in position, and it's a calculated risk. That's what I'm doing. I'm not recommending that for anybody, but I will insist anybody use safety glasses and preferably a full face shield for if these wires come out. Don't want one of those uh, stuck in anywhere. You won't be able to see it coming and you won't be able to see after it comes. Um, but that's the upgrade I did for this process because considering the number of square feet, that grinder there would work for, you know, 10 or 20 square feet, approaching it easy without burning up the tool. But for this larger surface, I've gone to the grinder. The second thing and probably the main takeaway of this whole process that I'll um, give to you today is to um, increase the speed and effectiveness of this process. And the way I do that is simply by spraying the surface with a light coat of water. Simple as that. Um, doing it with the uh, wire wheel and dry. This wood is pretty dense, pretty hard. I really have to push. It generates heat. It starts to um, not really burn the wood, but you can tell it's getting hot. It takes a lot longer. Plus, it puts a heck of a lot of dust in the air and there's really no way I can think of to collect dust off of that tool. But a spritz of water works wonders. I'll link to all this stuff as much as I can uh, on the Amazon Influencers page for Next Level Carpentry. That buffer you're not going to be able to get. It's an, an, it's an antique. Um, there was a gas station fire when I was a kid and this was left in the smoldering ruins. I picked it up, had it sent in and rebuilt and it's worked like a charm ever since. Like I said, I've had that for literally 50 years. Never let me down. Um, the wire wheel, pretty standard equipment, but these particular ones, um, I should be able to link to those on Amazon. I bought those locally just because I was at the store at the time. Uh, the pump sprayer, this one's from Ace. I'll find one of these online and link it. Works like a charm and it beats the heck out of a pump spray, although I've been using this quite a bit on these other beams. But firing this thing up allows me to get a nice even mist on here really quick. Plus this is good for all sorts of other jobs around the shop. So this little corner is what I did with the five inch Metabo. Now I'm gonna get serious, do this whole surface with the Milwaukee. Um, the, the wood is stable, it's all dry by spraying a quick coat on here of wood. I'm not letting it soak in, most of it evaporates and actually the majority of it gets pulled out with the wire wheel as I go over it. Um, if you're worried about your boards warping or cupping with a little moisture in them, uh, you might have to take ex extra measures, but with this white oak, the way these beams are built and connected, it's not a problem at all. Quick mist of the surface is great. Got to get my Smurf gloves back on here. Let's give that water a quick wipe to kind of even it out on the surface. And I've wetted this corner all the way along because I'm going to work the weathering process on that corner as I'm doing 
this part of the beam, then I'll flip around and do that other edge because the edges are easier to do from one side. Don't need quite so much water down in that hole. And I should be wearing an apron, but that's gonna to be too much of a mess with this camera gear. I'll start on the end. This end butts into another beam. I want this end weathered along with kind of the corners of that whole mortise and tenon, but I don't want to compromise the corners of this mortise too much because it makes those little uh, stub wedges fit funny in there. I found that out from experience. I wrap my hand around the cord like this so the cord doesn't get caught in the process here and get after it. As I'm doing this, I've got the brush at an angle so that I'm getting a nice even approach to the grain on these corners. And I'm being careful not to sweep the machine this way because I don't want the wire brush running crossways or at an angle to the grain. So my action is this way, it's as parallel to the grain as I can for the best weathered effect. Close up down at this end, you can see that the just com dust comes out just kind of as hairs and it's a little bit damp so it's not flying around in the air. Just goes on the surface of the wood and on my shirt. But the brush, you can see how it just dries the water off that way, just like the squiggle marks in the beginning. Uh, as I'm going through here, I can tell I already, I did everything that's light colored and I haven't done what's dark colored. My body position and the handling of this tool uh, makes the work position and stability imperative. If this piece was to jump out of the way, I'd have a fracas. I'm not going on this side of the beam because this pushed the brush too close to my wrist. So I learned that if I just do one corner on one side, flip it around to the other corner, it comes out great, relatively safe and painless. process is consistent, repeatable, and controllable. And for a job like this, when there's so many beams and so many square feet, that's really important. If I do a job that's, or if I use a process that's not consistent or repeatable, the beams aren't going to look like they came from the same batch, and that, and that doesn't work. I'm going to spritz this other edge with some water. It doesn't take much. And this way I'm able to weather this corner where that'll meet the ceiling of the house. Uh, and it'll be weathered right up into the corner. I don't want to stop short of that. They have kind of a smooth edge on there. But my technique is to push on the corner and move off the edge. It's a pain when the wheel drops off this edge and clunks down. It happens sometimes, but the less it happens, the quicker the process is. I'll go handheld and close up here to show you what the surface looks like after that wire brushing process. It's dulled down again. There's a lot of contour in there. If I get right down on the surface, you can see the contour created by the plane, the spoke shave, and the fishtail gouge, but it's just kind of aged out with that wire wheel. I think that covers most of what I wanted to say about uh, the weathering process, uh, the two size tools, the grinders, some different things, uh, and primarily about spritzing of water, especially on a hard wood. It makes the process go really great. It's easy to, to track what's going on and it keeps the dust out of the air and makes the grain softer so it pulls out of there quicker. Right now, I'm gonna do one set of these um, tenon wedges, these little stubby things. 
So you can see how that goes in here, why I waited to do it until now, and what they look like when they're aged out. Well, anybody that watched the video about making the joinery for these beams, um, the massive tenon joinery, saw how to make these little um, stub wedges for this wedge tenon effect here. I've got two little side pieces and a middle piece so that it looks like a wedge was driven in between two other wedges to fill that little hole. And I marked the bottom of these little stubs to show that there's a two degree taper on this edge and it's square the rest of the way around so that I can put a line towards the center of the hole on each side and that leaves a double tapered space in between. And just a little bead of glue around the edge, couple through the middle, a little bit on this mating face here. And that orientation line helps me keep these pieces in order because the two degree angle is pretty tough to see. Same with the center piece. The circle means it's the top. The wedge is going down. And that's all it takes to hold those in there forevermore. Everybody that knows me knows what's next. Take a little bit of sawdust out of my miter box bag. I was cutting some yellow plastic in there, so that got all weird looking. That sawdust dries up the glue squeeze out and the putty knife scrapes it away. I especially wouldn't want to use water, warm water, to wash that glue off this end grain. It'd go right in there and the stain would never take. If the beams are getting painted, it's not such a bad thing, but I just don't want to get in that habit. And this might seem a little counterintuitive, but I chose to put clean finished wedges into a beam that's already been weathered. I want to make sure that the weathering goes right up to the edges of these wedges for a good look. Now I need to weather these parts out. Um, I don't haven't done it all on all of them, but you can take a chisel and do any uh, pre-distressing of these that you think is necessary. It'll make it look good. I did, hardly did this on any of them, but just showing it for the video if it's something you want to include. You can get a little more effect on it with a chisel, whatever. You could use a gouge, a grinder, all sorts of stuff. And then I switch back to the Metabo grinder. And because of its size, it is highly maneuverable and controllable. And I can get around this little block. I don't want to dig into the wood out here so much as I want to get this grain weathered out. So the first thing I do is pull out the soft grain out of this uh, out of that end grain and then round off the edges. I don't really want any sharp square corners for the look on this beam. That's about all there is to that. You can see that little bit of burning because the brush is dry. I could wet this down if I wanted but it would really pull moisture into there because it's end grain and I'd just as soon avoid that. This will stain up nice. A little darkness in there isn't going to hurt anything. Well, I guess that's about everything I wanted to show you about this uh, hand scraping, texturing, and weathering process for these beams. Um, the next step um, is to finish up everything, get it all caught up to the point where it is uh, wire brushed like this and ready for stain. Uh, then I'll stain it. Uh, with this gray stain like this, then there'll be some faux finishing. That'll be another video when it gets, gets into that, but at least you know how I got to this stage. Uh, this kind of um, faux finishing can be done strictly with brushes on a flat surface. With a, if it's just streaked with a stiff brush and coated and recoated and all those sort of things, a graining uh, tool and everything. But having actual contour to the beam, hand um, hewn, hand scraped, contour and then weathering out the grain just makes it a whole lot more convincing, uh, which I hope, I uh, think and hope you'll agree uh, when these beams are all installed um, in the family room where they go. I've got a, 
uh, do all this work tonight, get these things stained. They're going to load these all up uh, tomorrow, take them to the job site and pre-fit them. Uh, the center beam, this piece, is uh, finished length, but each of those pieces um, gets scribed next to the wall, the tile fireplace, and that sort of stuff. I want to do all that fitting before I go through the steps of this full finish because I don't really want to mess this up once I've got it done. I'll just take them back, screw them right back in place um, for a pretty seamless, painless final fit up. So I guess I'll wrap this thing up, uh, get it uploaded. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time editing this. I'm pretty sick of it after a particular video that um, released the 12.01 a.m. today. Um, but I'll get it set up. If you like the video, you like what you saw here and learned, uh, I'd appreciate you subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. Part of uh, growing a YouTube channel and building a YouTube channel is earning income from it. Uh, YouTube does some of that. Amazon does some of it. Um, I've recently set up Patreon. If there's anybody that's uh, so inclined and wants to support uh, the video work here at Next Level Carpentry by going to Patreon, there's a button there. It's also on nextlevelcarpentry.shop, uh, the website. Uh, I've got some Next Level Carpentry t-shirts, gears, coffee mug, um, that sort of thing. Every little bit helps um, go towards uh, video production. I'll keep cranking out content like this for you and uh, really appreciate the encouragement and support that viewers send in via comments. So I guess that's it. I'm going to keep working. You can go uh, kick back and um, until next time, thanks for watching.